Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Ball. I'm the Artistic Director of the South Bank Centre, and it's my absolute joy to welcome you all to the Queen Elizabeth Hall tonight for a very special event. Uh, you may have noticed that across London, arts organisations are uniting to celebrate one of the most important artists of our age. So a retrospective at the Royal Academy by the first female art artist to solely occupy the main exhibition spaces, to a takeover this coming week at the South Bank Centre, and more on that soon, to seven deaths of Maria Callas, her opera at the ENO, London is collectively celebrating the breathtaking 50-year career of the performance artist Marina Abramovich. Marina's performance left an indelible impression on me as a young curator, and I know it's left an indelible impression on so many others who've borne witness to it. She demands of us that we be here now, fully present in the moment to confront the questions her extraordinary performances ask. She has brought performance art from the margins to the centre of our arts and cultural life. Tonight's discussion celebrates the publication of the beautiful Marina Abramovich, a visual biography, that promises to provide a unique insight into Marina's extraordinary body of work and trajectory as an artist. Marina is in conversation with a co-author, Katja Tylovich, and the talk's going to be punctuated by a series of short films which have been curated especially for this evening and that draws into defining artworks and moments of Marina's life and career to date. The book combines new interviews, never-before-seen images, and fascinating ephemera from Marina's personal archives to create a visual landscape of a personal and artistic life. And fittingly, it blurs the lines between artists and art, and the biography acts as a keystone in the life of the most important performance artist in the world. Tonight's event also anticipates, and we're very excited about this at the South Bank Centre, an extraordinary takeover of the Queen Elizabeth Hall building this week that will transform this entire building into a set for enthralling durational performances, curated by Marina and the Marina Abramovich Institute, and performed by 13 performance artists drawn from across the world. Through specially created site-specific performances in every conceivable part of the building. So if you think you know what performance looks like, looks like here, think again, because this is using the whole building to its full effect. So through 13 performances drawn from artists across the world, specially created, uh, artists are engaging with endurance, presence and participation, creating an infinite possibility of encounters between audiences and artists. I know that for Marina, personally, this project and the work of her institute that is so committed to training the next generation of international performance artists is as vital as anything that she's created and is absolutely central to her legacy. Some of the nights have fantastically already sold out, but I'd urge you to experience and witness a central part of Marina's work in a truly unique event for London at the South Bank Centre this week. As part of our ongoing commitment to making our events accessible, tonight's event is live captioned by Nicola Dutton, Copies of Marina Ivanovich's visual biography are available from our bookselling partner, Foils, and both Marina and Katja will be signing copies in the foyer immediately outside the auditorium after the event. So on to tonight. We're going to watch a brief film specially curated for tonight, after which Marina and Katja will take to the stage and set the scene for what's going to be a fantastic discussion. Thank you.
Thank you. It was optional. <laughs> it's good to be on stage with Marina. <laughs> I'm terrified, to tell you the truth. You know, most of the time I'm in the control of everything, of my work, my art, the pictures I'm going to choose that I show to the world, and literally everything sells, limits of the body, physical, mental, and so on. But then culture come to my life and turn everything upside down. But before we start this lecture, let's just talk about our dress code. I didn't know what to dress this morning. First, I got from archive Vivian West with beautiful things, too much. Then I got from the <laughs> Rosanda Ilinich option, maybe you can, you know, choose something from, from my shop. I say no. And then I look and I say, the only way we have to do it, to, the, to go back into this communism, absolutely black. <laughs> because in our country, always somebody die and we always wear black, you know, they die in the early time of our life, in the late time, but there's always dead bodies around. So I think she dressed black, I dress black. Can we just show our clothes, please? Yeah. Okay, let's go on. Marina, this book made you nervous. Is that true? Yes, absolutely terrified. Would you like to tell us why? You know, the, really the truth is, when I look at my life, and it's like 55 years, it's just not, you know, yesterday, so long, I always tr look into my books, and it looks like the same photographs over and over and over again, and look like really boring, you know, for, at least for me. And when you buy one book, and you buy two books, and three books, and you see same images, you get bored too. So, uh, I met Katja, and we actually had this incredible uh, kind of contract based on pure trust. And she suggests, why your office give me the images that you don't approve, or you never see them at all, even not see them at all. And then I, I trust Katja, you know, she come from this, she come from this, you know, Slavic countries. You, you know, people, Slavic people trust other Slavic people. <laughs> And let's not spe specify the names of the countries. So, <laughs> so, Never unspecified, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then, you know, let's, let's, we, we wrote to the, my office and Katya, the, the, the Katie, she sent to her, without me seeing any of this, more than 23 or 24 thousand images. Yeah. Yeah. So that she could take them as she w wish, and then you know, I only what I have to do is to actually comment on them. And what is interesting about this lecture, they have no idea. It's the first time that I'm not prepared because I didn't choose anything. I don't know what we're going to talk because she have all the questions. She also had questions for the public. I actually hardly anything to do. So let's start from the beginning. I I'd like to. Uh <clears throat> comment, it's not only 24,000 digital images, we also had two airplane hangers worth of archival material. There were works that Marina made, family albums, uh, newspapers that your mother had kept. There were things from before your birth that we were looking yeah, at. Just to specify, my mother, you know, coming from communism, she kept everything, because everything can be evidence. <laughs> So Marina, let's talk about how we worked. Uh, they would send something to me. I make a selection about 100, 120 images. Then you almost faint when I show them to you. Uh, what was it about the images that surprised you? And then my main question about Katja, why you choose so fucked up images all the time? <laughs> Is images I will never choose, but also the images that I even did not exist. I never saw images of my grandmother holding the two big plates with the, with the pork meat. I mean, never saw them before. But whatever, you know, there was something. And then, you know, there was another thing that I really freak out is when on the end of the book, when we came to the end, you know, I find and to realize all my friends, people, my, my love stories, people I love, people, you know, they don't love me, the ones that hate me, but whatever, nobody's in the book. And then she said, but how I should know? I don't know these people. 
<laughs> well, that's true. The, the last chapter, I think we sat together and argued for about a week straight. Very, very, like a family would argue. It was not a, um, it was not a aggressive argument. But Marina, uh, why do you keep everything? I know your mother did. I, I don't know. It's so interesting that since I was a very young child, I always had a sense of history. There's something that everything can be important, that every napkin and every little piece of paper, little ticket, whatever, could be, could be important. I never keep them close to me. I always keep them in the boxes, somewhere, storage. So I remember you coming to upstate New York and seeing this enormous material. I mean, my, my mother kept uh, and, and, uh, even every receipt from the, uh, from, from the, I don't know, uh, the shop buying the grocery. Everything is kept always in my life. And this is how we get into this enormous material. And then I remember that, the, you know, my boyfriend, I'm always criticizing how he keep everything. But actually, I'm worse, but I only keep in that nobody see it, in a kind of storage situation, secret and cover. <laughs> but it's all there. It's, it's, I don't know, this is really something that I need to keep. Uh, you know, during the process of this book, we came to realize that you're very superstitious. Do you think that holding on to everything is a form of superstition? That's quite interesting. I mean, I'll just tell you a few superstitious situations, all from my grandmother. Black cat cross the road, you can't cross. You have to see somebody else crossing, and then you can cross, and then the other person get bad luck, knock you. <laughs> if you, if you, if you get out of the house and you see pregnant woman, the first thing you have to do is to take button of your shirt and throw to the right shoulder. So three pregnant women, three buttons gone of your shirt. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, then if you, you can't ever put the salt you know, on the table by touch by another hand, have to be separate. If you spill the salt, big bad luck, comes in three days. If you, if you, if you teeth in dream fall down and you don't have the pain, somebody that you don't care die somewhere, but if this pain, somebody for your family. I mean, everything has the meaning. It's so complicated. <laughs> we actually have a photograph of Marina standing and waiting for a black cat to cross <laughs> that we found in the archives. We have a few of the uh, very superstitious photographs. Yeah, I know. I can't, you know, you have to be careful with superstition. <laughs> Did you ever try to get rid of these superstitions? No. Hmm. I, I, I believe in everything. We're <laughs> <laughs> not showing the images? Not yet. Oh, we can show images. Oh. You want to go already? I was just thinking to follow some images. Okay. Kind of, you know, uh, can otherwise we... it's so boring to see just our faces. <laughs> Let's show part one, please. I mean, my father, he looked all like a like Christmas tree. He loved medals. And this is my mother with the Tito. She was the director of the Museum of Art and Revolution, always you know, dressed double suit and the brush on the right side. This is me as a little devil you know, on the back. <laughs> all the kids were dressed beautifully in the princesses. I was the only dressed in devil, devil clothes. I have no idea why I was four years old. <laughs> oh, the, my That's grandmother, of course. Yeah, she had communism. <laughs> the portrait of me. This is all your choice. I am mm. nothing to do with that. And why you like all these photographs from the different, uh, you know, cards, communist cards, the, you know. It's a sense of place. That's me with sense my mother yeah. cap. Not great photo. No, it's a good, good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm not commenting everything. It's just that's wrong to talk. <laughs> This you know. Yeah, we don't yeah. talk about this. <laughs> you, can, you see it in the show, yeah. I think you recognize this one too. Never saw it in my life. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's this go. This we let's should go. come back to. Yes. Art as an exit for Okay, let's, let's go on with your questions. Yeah. No, we will watch these, then I'll ask you. <laughs> oh, no. Anyway, some, you know, you, she chose some parts of the, my video installations were there in, a, in, the, um, in the show. This is me somewhere in the north of the Yugoslav Sea. This is what okay, Ula. With Ula is screaming. You know, I actually lost the voice for one and a half months after this piece. He didn't. A communist body, fascist body. You know, I was born in communism, he was born in fascism in 1943 as a baby. And we both, you know, fall in love with two different 
common, you know, system, political systems that absolutely love my life. The, my dog, Alba. Mm -hmm. She was the shepherd from Albania. We'll tell this story too, how you mm. came to Amsterdam. Oh my God, but this is a long story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I live in Amsterdam as seven years illegal. And then finally I come to the police and ask for the passport to give to me. And they say, but you're illegal, we can just send you to the, you know, back to your country. I say, but you send me back, I'll come again. So they say, <laughs> so, so they, I had lots of activity as an artist there. And then they say to me, okay, you know, we give you six months and we will, if you speak Dutch, we will get the passport. So. In these six months, I bought every single book in Dutch and I put them under my pillow because knowledge comes through sleep. <laughs> and, and I had a total problem with my neck. And then the day arrive, next, next, next day arrive, and I have to, you know, give a small, small conversation in Dutch to get his passport. And you know, Dutch in the morning, they're very slow. First, they speak joints, they, speak, they, they smoke closer joints the day before, they drink coffee in the morning. And uh, I, day before, I, I wrote a text in Dutch, and I learned by heart with a friend of mine, phonetically. Just the text, like, I'm, my name is Marina Bramovic, and I come with you. <coughs> Democratic country, blah, 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 really nice, nice text. And then, eight in the morning, there, I, there's a commission of three people, I dramatically open the door. And nobody asked me anything, everybody drink coffee, and I say, Ich bin Marina Abramovic. And I say all this text, and they look at me like, you know, what just happened? I say, this is all, <laughs> this is all I know in Dutch. And they start laughing like crazy, and they say, okay, you know, we made the effort, you gave you the passport, but you have to learn Dutch. I forgot the text same evening. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my story, Dutch passport, which I still have. So this is 1975, right? Yeah. You're 29 years old. Uh, how spontaneous was the decision to move to Amsterdam? Oh, it was a love story, and I fell in love with, uh, with Ulay, and uh, you know, I actually escaped home because I was living with my mother till I was 29. And every single performance I have to make before 10 in the evening because 10 in the evening I have to be home because only bad girls are out there after 10. I was totally strict, you know, military control. My mother would control me even if I sleep in the bed with, the too, with too much movement. She wake me in the middle of the night to make the bed and sleep, go back to sleep. So when you come to the hotel, if you think I'm not there, you just open the, the bed sheet, I close, you know, very, very quiet. But it was so much, you know, the restrictions that I had in my life. So when I fall in love with the, and I want to, you know, escape home, I escape home with 20. And she went to the police. <clears throat> and she said, you know, that my daughter escaped. And said how she was dressed. Here she explained everything. And then she said, how old is she? She said, 29. And then the police say, Kamara Dabramovic is about time. We have more important things to do at Centre Home. <laughs> so, Marina, tell me, what does this do to your art when you no longer have the restrictions of a 10 p.m. curfew? This was a mess. Because, you know, the Slavic people, we are dramatic and we have all this pain of the universe in us. So when we are in our country, we are not happy in our country. Then we live outside and we are happy because we are outside. We are, you know, it is always full of restrictions that you actually have the courage to break them. So when you, I came in, in, the 60s, in the end of 60s, 70s in Amsterdam, this was such a freedom. I mean, we are talking, you know, of, the, of the, all these hippies running around. I mean, walking naked, nobody give a shit. You can walk naked, who cares? In my country, they did, but not there. So I had to build an entire new set of restrictions that I actually fight for, that actually my work have the meaning. It's not easy to get too much freedom, you know. Is this when you start having real conditions in your work? Oh, I love conditions, yes. You put the conditions and you have to do them. You know, this is one of my favorite, favorite things to do that, you know, performance have to be, you have to deal with restrictions in performance because if I will rehearse my work with, with the restrictions that I put myself, I will never do it because it's too hard, it's too difficult and I will give up. But when you just have restrictions, you go in the front of the public, you use public to help you to go through this. And, this, and then you, you, you are there, have a different type of responsibility. And then you can do it, but not at home. 
You told me that the first work that you did in Amsterdam was kind of a way to get back at your mom. Can you tell us about oh. that? So I come to Amsterdam and what I see, you know, is all this red district with the prostitutes sitting in the window. So this is something that in, in education and my mother, this is the lowest you can go to be prostitute. So of course, as I like to do things the most difficult, the things I'm afraid of and not I like, it was terrifying. I look for the prostitute, was 12 years, you know, the professional prostitute and I was 12 years professional artist and I changed role with her. She comes to the gallery to be me, and I become, I go to the, to the window to be her. But this t turned to be disaster, because we had the two open cameras, the one secret camera from my situation, and another one from her. And, uh, and then we put, two, sorry, the two movies to look together later. And she said to me, you will die as a prostitute. You have no talent at all. <laughs> 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 And the story was that, you know, first it was very difficult to find somebody. And the idea was to be six hours in the window and she's six hours in the gallery. But I, I at that time, I only had, a, in our, it was like 50 pounds, you know, the, the, my fee was six hours. And she said to me, I'm not Mother Teresa. This, <laughs> I, I, I give you three hours because I like you, but I get 10 times more money than that. So she gave me these three hours. And, um, and then, you know, it's so interesting uh, how that works. There is a window, and there is a, you sit in the window, and there are two mirrors, and you have to look left and right, and you have to observe people coming in. So as the man comes who is very, very scared, and small, and, you know, and incredibly timid, you have to make very mothery position. And if the guy is very sexy, you have to, take, to turn into another sexy position. But in my case, I, I was sitting and looking in one line like a performance, and everybody was scared even to come in. And then she told, she, told me, she told me that I could not go under her price. I had two customers. One was drunk and, and just asked for her, and the second one didn't want to pay the price. So this is all my experience. But her part was so interesting because she came in the gallery. So, as she never been in the gallery in her life. So they ask her, you know, journalists, everybody there, how you feel? And she said, I feel too hot. And she started taking clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then they ask her, and what do you know about art? She said, I know everything but fucking nothing about art. <laughs> this was such a real thing. Yeah. Then I have so many, you know, feminists and, and psychologists, you mm -hmm. know, going there and, um, you know, doing interviews with her because she becomes some kind of really star doing that work with me. And then she was so incredibly angry of all of them. She said, I'm doing more social work than anybody else. And people. <laughs> You know, people are talking to me. Anyway, let's, I mean, we're spending incredible much time on this piece. It's good, it's good. Okay. You know, the whole book, really, in essence, it's a series of uh, jokes in some ways. It's a series of punchlines yeah. about all of the absurd moments of a life. But which I like about this book is the book that you don't read in any history of, of the work of his performance art. It's something that you will know that you normally don't know from anybody else because they really tell the funny truths from real life. That's what I'm doing. And, and you are actually the best to take them out of me. <laughs> yeah, we sat there, we looked through every photograph. Uh, normally you would kind of chide me for picking a <laughs> unflattering photograph. Oh, we have not back. Okay. No. You want to do a second? Yeah. Second there's just a second. load of. Uh, can we show the I second? I like part some of images. Images, you know, please. Feels better. Oh, this is something. Oh yeah. Australia. Okay. Let's talk about, not about Australia. Let's talk about other stuff. Other stuff. Like uh, let's talk about Tito. Let's talk about Tito. <laughs> there was, I believe, there was something you wanted to share with the audience. A song. Oh my God, a song. <laughs> I promised to sing Tito's song. Okay. It's, when I was four years old, actually, till I was four years old, I didn't want to walk for some reason. I don't know why, but I was really singing and uh, singing, simple singing and, uh, and talking. I would say, give me a glass of water. It was, everybody was so strange. What, 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 what's wrong with her? But then, you know, come this communism and then come all these Tito things. And my, grand, my mother will always told me that I was born on the, you know, on the 29th of November. And the 29th of November is the day of Republic where every kid born on that day go to Tito, sit on his lap and get candies. And then 
and every time came this 29, I never go to Tito and I never get candies. And she always said to me it was not good enough. And then I realized that I was not born in 29 at all. I was born on the 30th of November. <laughs> she just punished me all this time. And that was never good enough. This is, you know, the story of my life. But which is interesting about the Tito songs, that the, these pioneer stories that you have the little pioneer scarf, yeah. and then you're in these huge groups of pioneers singing to Tito. And I was thinking, I have to sing you one Tito song, because also text is ridiculous looking today. Okay, my voice is terrible, and I never do this normally, but, <laughs> but tonight is a different night. Wait, I didn't start yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get courage. Dru, druže ti to ljubičice plava, tebe voli omladina prava. Huh! Druže ti to ljubičice plava, tebe voli omladina plava. One more time. Druže ti to ljubičice plava, tebe voli omladina prava. Huh! Who is very important part. And then, <laughs> basically... <laughs> basically, the, the text is, is the same. The text say, the, the druze, the camera Tito, you are our violet, and all youth loves you. That's the one message, but the second message is even better. Um, druze Tito. Druže ti to, mi ti se kunemo, da sa pravo puta ne srenemo. Druže ti to, mi ti se kunemo, da sa pravo puta ne srenemo. Druže ti to, mi ti se kunemo, da sa pravo puta ne srenemo. Kamera Tito, we give you word of honor, and we will never take wrong direction. Look what happened. <laughs> We had one country, now we have six. God. <laughs> oh, God. This is the standing ovation part. Oh, my God. <laughs> Marina, you said your father used to take you to these big, charismatic Tito talks, yeah? Yeah. But you also told me you were a very shy little girl scared to walk down the street. So I'm having a hard time piecing the two people together. It takes time and practice, really. Yeah. I mean, as, okay, can I just uh, picture myself as a child? Big nose on the child face. Pimples <laughs> everywhere. Short cut, cut hair above the ear, really ugly. Orthopedic shoes. Big, or big glasses, communist way frame, and uh, very tall, very skinny, they call me giraffe. <laughs> I mean, and then I really, really wanted to, I was fascinated by Brigitte Bardot. All of I want to do is to have Brigitte Bardot nose. So I cut, the, I mean, she didn't age well now, but at that time, <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in those days I didn't know. Anyway, I took the, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I hope she never heard this. All right, so I took, I took the photograph of her front, and left side, right side, the right side. And every time I go to my mother and say, can I, can I just you know, have operation my nose? She slapped my face, end of the story. <laughs> then I was, we are talking 15 and, and developing perfect plan. On the Sunday, my mother was talking to the friends. Started, my father was playing chess with neighbors, with old soldiers, like always. And the bedroom was completely empty. And we had this big matrimonial bread with very sharp edges. So my idea was really close to perfection. I had the old photographs of the Brigitte Bardo in my pocket. I would go to the bedroom. I would spin very fast, as fast as I can. I would, I would really fall on the edge of the bed, break my nose. I go to the hospital, Richard Bard the photographs are in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I really did this. I went to the bedroom, I spin fast, I fall on the bed, I miss completely, cut my chin really badly, <laughs> needed stitches. I fall on the floor, my mother came in the room, Richard Bard the photographs on the floor. <laughs> she slapped my face, bring me to put me stitches, end of the story. <laughs> I think 
I think you're really special, public. I don't tell these kind of stories every day, honestly. Okay, let's it's do another one. It's just for this book. Let's do another one, because you've inspired me. What about the uh, washing machine story? You really wanted this one in the book. Oh my God, washing yeah. machine. Okay, so, first of all, to tell you a little bit, are you interested in all these stories, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just generally, okay. We are not talking art here, we're talking real life. All right, so. My mother was completely crazy about hygiene, but in a kind of, I think, mental way. I mean, she <laughs> would literally wash banana with detergent. Because <laughs> then she, she, I mean, if I give her a bouquet of the red roses, she would take them and she will immediately put them between books and newspapers, and smash them to dry. And I say, but why will dry roses? And she said, but yes, you put in the water, develop bacteria, it's not good. <laughs> and then, and that was like, everything was about the cleaning, cleaning. So we was one of the first, actually, um, family, maybe few family in Belgrade who got from Switzerland washing machine. It was a big deal. We are talking 50s. Wow, washing machine. So we put this washing machine in my in, in the in the in the in the bathroom, and the washing machine was very old. They had the I mean the, old, the the first ones. They had the round thing that you put the thing and turning, and then the two wheels on the side. They're made from the from the from the rubber, and then you put between two wheels the sheet, and the sheet really almost dry because the wheels are very very soft, and they're moving, they're moving around. So my grandmother didn't trust washing machine at all. So she will anyway wash everything by hand and just put in the washing machine, you know, for the luxury. <laughs> so, so now my mother and father is working, my grandmother is at home and me. And you know, it's a new object at home. So I'm sitting in the, in the bathroom and I'm looking at the moving of these wheels, hypnotical, like one of the few moments of meditation. And I'm looking at these wheels and I'm looking and I start playing and I put the finger in and out, in and out, in and out. And in one point, they got my hand. This is so hard, it's so painful because taking water from the, from the dry you know, bed sheets, can you imagine my hand? And I start screaming like hell. And the machine slowly, slowly is moving up. And my grandmother's a heavy woman. We live on sixth floor. And she came to, the, ki to the, the bathroom, but you know, her knowledge of technology, electricity, you know, below zero. So she ran down, she see me what happened, but her idea to take off electricity from the plug from the wall didn't, didn't cross her mind. So she let me with this machine going with my hand up. She ran from the sixth floor to the street and started screaming and got a really <laughs> big guy with the big muscles, so the, as, the, as the strongest person he can. So the, he ran with this guy, Upstairs, so he is also with the kind of limit knowledge of technology. <laughs> <laughs> Does not cure him to take fucking, you know, electricity out of the wall, and he took these two wheels with his force, pure muscles, took it out. My hand was already here, it was, and he get terrible electric shock and fall down. <laughs> So now we have my hysterical grandmother, what to do, and I am completely out conscious with the hand blowing in blue like this. Of course my mother entered, slip, slap my face again. <laughs> we got both into hospital, end of the story. <laughs> Okay, let's let's you, make a little you, break into something. You made an artwork. <laughs> Less tragic. No, you made an artwork about it later. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. I made the artwork. I actually found in America exactly same type of, of the washing machine, and I put the. It would, I, I actually managed to cover the, the wheels with the gold leaf because it becomes something special. And actually, it's the artwork now. Yeah. My washing machine. Yeah. So you know, it's really important as an artist that you can make work from everything. Yeah. And I always believe that the, you know, the, the more shitty childhood you have, the better artists you get. <laughs> Marina, we have some questions from the audience. It's wait, where are the second line of the photographs? You, let, let's okay, wait. We have... Let's do a little audience question. Oh, okay, we'll... all right. <laughs> We'll get, we'll get to the photographs, I promise. So there is a person named Beatrice in the audience here. She wants to know, how has your relationship with pain evolved or changed along the years? Oh, God, now a serious question. Okay. Well, it can be related to the washing machine. No, it's, uh, no, not really. Because, you know, I, I always believe with performance art that we have to deal with the three, the, the kind of fears of human being. 
is the fear of dying, fear of suffering, and fear of pain. And if you look into art history, you know, from paintings, uh, uh, sculptures, drawings, to cinema, literature, you know, all of a theater, we all actually, in a certain way, stage that stories. Mm. And if you're working with the body, like I do, body is my material, and body is my subject and object of my work, then I stage difficult situation that I have to go in front of the public, public become my mirror, so if I can do this with my body and can get rid of a fear of pain, then you can do this with your own life. So that's really the idea, because actually pain you can control. Physical pain is you can control. The one the thing you can't control is emotional. Emotional is something I am not good in it yet. But, um, but physically it is, because you have to understand where the pain comes, what, what, what is happening. And then when you really stage the different situations, then really you can learn from them. But also this reflects so much to the very old traditions of shamanism and Aborigines Central Australia and the Tibetan monks and uh, you know, the retreats where actually the, you go through the very difficult initiations who are very painful. But why they're doing that, this kind of ancient civilization, we learn from them? Because they can have much better contact with the body. They can understand how telepathy works, how extrasense perception works. They can understand what is synchronicity. They can understand how they can actually they, they, they control the, the, their own body and how the, they can heal themselves from the pain. So this is the culture that I turn in my life is so many times, which I learn from them, and I actually take this knowledge into the performance, and, uh, and then I, I don't think, I, I think I'm fine with pain. I'm really fine. That means that works. You know, you, you're not, it doesn't mean that pain don't exist. It's just that you're not afraid of it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you told me while we were working together that the greatest pain wasn't, it's not when you're whipping yourself or you're doing the more um, kind of violent works, it was sitting in silence. Yeah, this was incredibly difficult in artists present, which looks like so simple, you just sit on the chair. But I ask you to sit three, four hours in the chair, see what happens. There's a point when you're sitting that every single muscle become contracted, and it's so hard. And you're thinking if you don't move in that particular moment, you're going to faint. But when you really the kind of learn about your willpower, and you say, no matter what, I'm not going to move now. I'm not going to move, I'm not going to move, and the body says, I'm going to faint. And then you say, so what, faint? But when you get that far, pain totally disappeared. And I experienced this over and over again. And then also the pain was caused by not, not moving. But then you start realizing, learning about your inside of your body, how much space we have in the body. We can have movement without actually moving at all, because there is a space between kidneys and the liver, between liver and the lungs, between all of these organs inside that can be moved with the breath and totally remove the, the pain. And then the pain did it didn't exist anymore. This was a huge, huge, huge um, kind of discovery. But you can only do this till if you go really to an end. You have mm -hmm. to go till then. That you say, okay, now I'm going to faint. Then happen. Mm -hmm. Not before. Mm -hmm. You have to invest. <laughs> okay, let's look at part three now of the images, please. Mm. Oh, little pioneer <laughs> walking around in the big shoes. <laughs> oh, this is the time with the war in ex Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. So this is the piece when I washed the bones as my, my answer to the war in Balkan war, that you never can wash the blood. This is the grave of my father from you, from you actually, from your hands. Everything what is left of my father was little razor blade, little sharpener, yeah. and the photographs yeah, of the family. So I made this piece called The Hero, which is dedicated to my father. He was national hero. And, and I really, why is sitting with white flag? Because hero actually, he never really like that to change. This is my mother. This is funeral of my mother. So both of them die. 
So this is the moment I actually like to, s uh, okay, method. Oh, no, and then, you know, <laughs> this is something completely different, Abramovich method, you know, which I teach. Okay, we're not going to, this is so complicated. <laughs> People just have to go and do the method. <laughs> Why do you choose the most factor? <laughs> this was a real question. <laughs> this is slow motion walking for six hours, you know, as one of the exercises. Oh, this was the painful moment. I've stopped after mm. 10 hours performing in, during the moment. This was somebody sitting in the front of me with a dress made by herself. Okay. Oh, I can't look at this. You can't look Do at I it? Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost over. <laughs> almost over. <laughs> no, it's, it's, the book is full of such interesting images that come from the really childhood, my life, forgotten images and the work. And then comes to this last book, yeah. last chapter, that we put the chapter on and I didn't know that I actually, you know, I almost died in four months ago. This was me in, in, a, in, a, in a intense care for six weeks. I had a lung embolism and um, I was in coma and I was thinking I will never sit in the front of you. And this, okay, can we stop here? Yeah, we're stopping here. Can we stop this image? This is a very important image to me. Can we go back? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think anyway, so. I just want to say that the last, this book is dedicated to, I have only left my brother, Ivana, and me. Her mother is dead, my, my father is dead, his young wife is dead, and Ivana is here in front of us in this building. She's now not that small anymore, she's a nuclear physician, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I would like to, to get some light on her because she's here, and I dedicate the book to Ivana Abramovich, the old book. Where is Ivana? Ivana? I guess. So, I need to tell a few stories about Ivana. Ivana, on this photo, she's five years old. And in reality, now she's 30, so it's the life change. But Ivana came with my brother in, during the, the war, the, 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 the Balkan War, to Amsterdam, literally to escape the bombing. And she was 10 years old, and she came, my brother is scientist and philosopher. She only brought the books, no clothes, nothing, it was crazy. And the little kid. And the little kid came, and I was always traveling, running around, and we have this big house. And every time I come back home, she had all these little, the, the, the kind of animals and the little dolls and things around, and little, little writings everywhere. And every time, you know, I'm so much into kind of minimalist, so I take all her stuff and I put back into the room. So I go to travel again, I come back, and all the stuff is everywhere. And then one day I say to Ivana, and she's 10 years old, I say, Ivana, Ivana, why all this stuff are everywhere? And she said, Marina, little children are afraid of empty spaces. Wow, <laughs> this was deep. <laughs> I stop <laughs> immediately. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Ivana, you should know, uh, so, Maybe not everyone here knows that, Marina, you were very, very close to death uh, when we were working on the 12th chapter. We were about to finish the book and you had a pulmonary embolism, unexpected. And uh, it was a very troubling time. All of a sudden, I get a phone call from Marina. I think you're on some sort of drugs. But you say, Ivana has to be in the book. This book is dedicated to Ivana. This is very important to her. I just want you to know how, uh, how, uh, how from the gut that is. 
Though this is something I you know, work with the pain, but the, the, the lung embolism was not something I could predict or I could, you know, I could uh, control. It was a really frightening moment of my life. So to me, I was always my joke now for the Open Royal Academy show. I say in the speech, I say, you know, 255 years, there was no woman in Royal Academy, big space. And if I, in last May, die, I will be the first dead woman in 255 <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> so, but as you see, very life again. But I'm even not playing this. soon. Yeah. <laughs> no, my grandmother died 103, so you know it was good age. I'm thinking, you know, it's really important for women to live over 100. Then it's really respectful, because you know, <laughs> look, Louise Bourgeois, she died. I don't know, 92. Uh, answer, the the yeah. Georgia Kiefer died 94. Yeah. They don't make 100. I really want to make point to making 100. <laughs> <laughs> And even from the hospital, Marina was calling me and saying, why don't you put this person into Chapter 12? Why isn't my friend in Chapter 12? So you are, re you are so dedicated that from the hospital bed, you're calling me to talk about this book. Yeah, because you didn't put any of my friends. <laughs> It was a disaster, <laughs> but, but you had the right, because I really give you complete trust of this whole thing. And you say, I don't know your friends, why I should put them in? I mean, you had your reason. <laughs> we came to a very diplomatic compromise. <laughs> no, that's true. So do we have any audience question? We have a lot of audience questions. Let's do them. On the, on the topic of being the first woman exhibited, uh, Tanya in the audience, wants to know, why do you think it has taken so long to get here? To get where? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you interpret as you like. <laughs> you mean what I am now? <laughs> you know, first of all, so many different reasons. You know, if you're a painter, it's faster maybe. But if you do performance, which I'm doing, performance is such a a difficult form of art, always been. And nobody ever, you know, wanted to be, you know, there as, as a, the mainstream art. You know, the video had the same, same kind of a, um, destiny, also the, 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 the photography, but very soon became, you know, part of the, of the contemporary art context. But performance never, we always have to fight. We always have to, you know, never been paid performing showing lousy spaces, always they invite us, oh, can you do a little performance in the opening of some, somebody else's show? And then you, everybody's sitting with these stupid drinks and nobody look at you what you're doing. I mean, it's really hardcore thing. So to fight for that, for a fight for you, for the, to, you know, to and create the institute which I had done, you know, the institute, the MAI, which is participating now the next week here with the incredible 11, the long duration of performances of 11 artists from different countries. This is something that is joy in my life, you know, that, that, that we have, that we have the, the kind of, uh, how you say, the, the, the something that is coming up, you know, mm. the performance art form to be preserved, wait, I'm losing voice, to, see, to be preserved and to be <coughs> continue. And in my, in my past, I've done so many different works, but I have to say that the long duration is the most transformative form of art. Mm. Because if you do something one hour, 50 minutes, 20 minutes, three hours, it's not the same. But when you're doing something for a long period of time, over a long period of days, you can't pretend. You have to show your true self, and you're vulnerable. And the public see vulnerability, and public also um, identify you vulnerability with their vulnerability. Mm. And you make this incredible emotional contact. The performance is very emotional and always been, you know, and that's something that really hits you in the guts. And the good work has this, this effect. Mm -hmm. And this is why, to me, you know, it takes so long. Everything takes so long, you know. I'm, live, I'm even grateful that I, I'm here and I'm, you know, still alive because, you know, so many artists, I mean, El Greco being recognized 100 years after he died. I mean, honestly, we have to, you have to have some positivity here. <laughs> <laughs> Marina, you told me Could that. Could be worse. <laughs> you, you said that El Greco was your first word. Is yes. true? Yeah. <laughs> My mother, you know, st was studying art history and they took me to the exhibitions everywhere. And I was, instead of mother and father, I was saying, El Greco. 
<laughs> it's ridiculous what I was. Yeah. <laughs> Did your mother tell you this? <laughs> you know, the people told me because yeah. I was comp constantly repeating El Greco. <laughs> See what happened to her. <laughs> so it was meant to be, yeah? <laughs> When we come to the, oh yeah, the questions, there's some jokes, I hope. Yeah, oh, some jokes, uh, not in the audience questions. Oh. But there is, a, there is one uh, question that uh, is related to what you just answered from uh, Chiara. Do you think that art has been therapeutic for you? You know, I hate to just say art is therapy, art is spiritual, art is this, art is that. Art have to be many, many things and have to have layers of meaning, and every society have to take layer that he needs at the time. That's what art, the good art should be. If it's only one layer, it's only therapeutic, then you do, then, sorry, then you just go and do therapy. You know, who cares? Have to be, <laughs> you know, have to be so much more. I always believe that art have to predict future, that mm. art have to be disturbing, they have to be social, they will be political, they will be spiritual, they will be, they will be also, you know, asking right questions and opening human mind and also discovering past and bringing into the new present. Yeah. And all of these things, if you have in one art work, then art can have long lives. Good art have a long life, you know. The, that's, and this, I'm always interested in this long life of art, you know, yeah. how, you know, still Marcel Duchamp is relevant, relevant, how Rothko is still relevant, Van Gogh, there's something in these works that really, that really have, you know, lots of... Do you think the know. public decides who's relevant or is there some power in the artist to make relevant work? No, there, there are two ways. The artist have to do the best that he can. Mm -hmm. I'm always talking about 150 percent. 100 is not enough at all for nobody. This extra 50 that you give everything, entire soul, and in your work, then when you can't do anything more, you're just left to universe. Yeah. What happened? What happened? You know that you can't do more. Yeah. But you have to do the best. Yeah. If you don't do the best, it's never good. Public feels. Public feel the fear, insecurity. Public feel when you're not secure. Yeah. You know, in the performance, which is so important, is to be in a present. The moment you stand in the front, in the front of the public, and you're doing long duration work, and your mind is somewhere, who knows where. Public feel this. You're not there. Whatever you're doing, you're not there. Mm -hmm. Public and you have to be in the same space, and energy dialogue have to happen. That's the incredibly important key. Speaking about being in the same place, there is a rather funny question from the audience. Somebody wants to have coffee with you. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the details after our talk. I, you know, of course I love coffee. I just want to tell you that, that I have like avalanche of humans who want to see me for five minutes and have the coffee. If I do this, I will have heart attack soon. <laughs> But this is a question for the audience. Let's make a point. And nobody ever asked me this in the audience. We make a point with a little coffee. With a little coffee. Okay, okay. I, I love Turkish coffee. I don't know about, you know, a little bit. <laughs> the same type of coffee my grandmother used to make. Okay, and uh, Yuval Golan has a question for you. I am curious about your perspective and opinion on AI and deepfake technology and whether you have any intentions of incorporating these mediums into your future projects. But I did, actually. I made the virtual technology, the piece, which I actually didn't like, and I don't think it's finished, and somehow didn't satisfy me. And then I make another work with mixed reality with the team drum, which I called The Life. And this was so much more interesting because it was built with 36 uh, video cameras so that actually I felt like almost particles of my life, of my, of my energy was kept in these 36 cameras. And, uh, and you know, when you see performance on video, we are talking about one camera, and you can still see the emotions of the work. But can you imagine with 36, you actually projection is in the space, you can walk through the projection, and, and you can be virtually in your living room, you know, or you can be, you know, sitting at the, at the kitchen. So that kind of work, to me, it's so interesting because somehow really deals with immortality. This life which I made and I show in Serpentine Gallery recently, it's for me only works if I'm not there anymore. Mm 
hmm. when I'm not live, that work really have much more sense because that, that is kind of technology is developing and I think it's going to be really better and better. But I'm open for everything. You know, I, I live life and hate relation to technology. I hate technology that took all our time and that we are addictive, you know, and we don't understand that we should have sometimes detox of our telephones, computers and everything. But at the same time, there is a lot of benefit. So it's a love-hate relation. Actually, uh, a lot of uh, people in the audience had questions about your thoughts on the afterlife and uh, how one faces death gracefully. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so that's... happy to be alive for the moment. <laughs> so you choose. That's a, that's I, a, that's a I, I am, big topic. I am all in your hands. <laughs> Let's see. Have you ever felt anxiety or a sense of urgency about time passing, either in your artistic endeavors or personal life? And how do you manage these feelings? This is from Susanna. I really think about that every day. Honestly, because it's so incredible how miraculously this life is, and that can happen any second. I mean, literally, we're sitting here and having this conversation, asteroid can fall from the ground and we all disappear. I mean, we have to have this notion that, 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 that of the temporality of our existence. You know, I, I really love the story going to the National Geography, you know, the, the National, whatever, the, uh, the Museum in National History in, in New York. And there is this huge, huge uh, um, observatory for the kids. And then it's only the program four or five minutes and you lie down and you look the sphere completely open in the front of you and then you see the entire, wow, entire Milky Way. <laughs> and then comes the little laser pointing, tiny, tiny blue planet who is not even in the middle of Milky Way, but somewhere like uh, in, in, I don't know, Newcastle, Manchester, whatever. <laughs> far, okay, not, Manchester is too close, somewhere far. <laughs> anyway, in periphery of Milky Way. And then you have some kind of voice, which is like Brad Pitt or John Clooney, George Clooney, and he say, and this is a planet Earth. <laughs> and you see this tiny little blue, fragile little planet, and this is us there. And you know, we are so incredibly, you know, how we call, we, we, we don't, we need to be humble. To, the, to, the, to that universe, and you have to be humble to ourselves, and incredibly, incredibly appreciate it that every day is a miracle. I, this is how I feel. Does your life ever feel like an accident, that uh, you were born and you would have stayed an artist, but stayed in Yugoslavia? You know, I always felt different. I always felt that I'm by mistake in Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. That somehow strange kind of play of energy put me in that country with the family I am and all the rest. But, you know, I always felt that I just want to get out and I wanted to have the, the entire planet as a, my studio, which I did. I, I travel almost everywhere. You know, after you've been almost everywhere, you understand that actually it's not that big, the planet. You can get claustrophobic almost, but okay, it's still places to go. But, but what, what is really important is, is that there's a sense of, 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 the, of the space and, and home where it is. I'm born in, in ex-Yugoslavia because that was the one country, but I don't feel ex-Yugoslav. I'm born, I live in Holland, I have Dutch passport, I'm not Dutch. I live in America, I only have a working visa, green card, whatever, I'm not American. I've been living in Paris, I've been living in, in, in Berlin, lots, millions of places, but only home is my own body. Mm -hmm. You know, like now I stay in a hotel, I say I go home, I mean, which home? But this is the home. It's the only home I actually can relate to. Mm -hmm. No matter what I, I don't like to be attached to physical things. Mm -hmm. I like to leave them. I like the, 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 the only place is your own self. Mm -hmm. And how long did it take you to really feel confident as an artist, that you're able to call yourself an artist? Right away. Right away. I, I mean, my first exhibition, I was 14 years old and was so jealous on Mozart because he started his career with seven. I was too late. <laughs> I was so late. I mean, I mean, I really could not handle it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I start very simple. It was so easy. I just was painting my dreams. I had such a vivid dreams. I had dreams in color, I had dreams in black and white. I had dreams that I dreamed a dream and I wake up in a dream and so on. So you wake up in the morning and you just paint the dreams, easy. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. This is what I was doing, <laughs> straight in the beginning as a kid. You, you did tell me there was a very profound moment when you knew you had found your medium. Can you talk about that moment? Do you remember it vividly? Yeah, I do. It's, it's, uh, the, the, it's really the, the time I was painting clouds. I was lying on the, on the grass somewhere in the park in Belgrade, looking at the sky. At that moment, there was no cloud, just blue sky. But I had this whole developed history of clouds. Clouds who are coming, clouds who are going, clouds who hit the bodies, uh, projection of the clouds, clouds as a kind of strange shadows, and so on and so on. And I looked to study clouds, it was no one. And then out of nowhere came 12 military ultrasonic planes. It just crossed the sky. And I look, and it was a drawing, you know, just in the front of my eyes, the drawing disappeared and blue sky again. And this was the moment. I stand up and I say, I, I can't go to studio. I can't go to studio to paint something which is two-dimensional, where I can actually paint, do everything. I could, I could uh, paint I could use fire, I could use water, I can use the body, I can use the sky, I can use aeroplanes. I went to military base immediately and asked if they give me 12 planes to make the drawing. <laughs> they called my father and said, you, you, your daughter is complete, complete insane. You know how much military planes cost to, to make her drawings and send me home. And then I didn't give up that easy. I was thinking, okay, I can start working with the sound. The sound was my first, actually, entrance into performance. So I went, I was having an idea, if I put the sound of speakers on the bridge, with the bridge falling down, and, uh, and then you're on the bridge, and the bridge is there visually, but the sound is not existing, could be interesting. So I have to go to city house, city, city hall, to ask for permission. They told me, if I do that, you know, that actually with vibration, the bridge can really fall down. So I, <laughs> so, so I could not do that. But then I went into my own home in the building where I'm living, and they put speakers all over the building with the sound, and then three, four minutes with the building breaking down. So all the, you know, people from the building run out, have a huge problem with the family. Everybody was thinking, was there's a something's happening terrible. Anyway, it was not easy beginning. <laughs> It, they're very subversive, your sound works. Uh, another one is you put uh, a loudspeaker into your art school and it had all of the departures of planes leaving. Oh, this is Student Culture Center. Yeah. You know, Student Culture Center was this place when we were waiting for the, to go to cinema, having conversations with the, <clears throat> you can go to the bookshop and so on. But it was so sad and so socialistic and so gray and we never had money to go anywhere, Tito time. I put a speaker with the sound of, the, of my voice repeating, please passengers can go immediately to the gate 345. It was only three gates, by the way, but 345 sounds big aeroport. <laughs> to the gate 345, the plane can go, in, the plane is leaving now to Hong Kong, uh, no, to, to, Ta Ta no, to Bangkok, Tokyo, and Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> so every three minutes, every pa person in this room is imaginary passenger to imaginary trip who never can take place. We have a whole section in the book of works rejected by the government that you were doing as a student. Oh, oh they're good. Mwah. Uh, these are good works. Shall I tell them to the, my first painting lesson? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Tell painting them about lesson. the first. Yeah. Anybody know my painting lesson? Some people Some know. Some people know. Oh, my God, what I do now? <laughs> but is the majority don't? Are you? Majority don't? Okay. You sure? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, again, 14 years old, getting my birthday, and my father asked what I want, and I say I want oil, oil, oil paintings. And um, because, you know, I was just doing with a, with a simple, you know, the tempera, but oil is like a real deal for, to, to start having paintings. So he took one of his soldiers, artists who become actually abstract painter, to go with me to buy the material. 
So we go to shop, buy canvases, can boxes of stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then we go to my little room, was my studio. So he cut the canvas irregularly, put on the floor, and then open one, one can and just throw some glue on the top, and then a little bit of cement, and a little bit of yellow gips and red powder, pigment, and then he put gasoline over the whole thing, and then he put the match and the whole thing explode, and he said, this is sunset, and he left. <laughs> So this is my first painting lesson. <laughs> if you're 14 years old, yeah, it's very impressive. <laughs> and then I was looking like, wow. So I stand there in the front of this for a long, long time. And then very carefully, when this dry for months, I took four nails and put on the wall. And then I left with my family to vacation. It was August. And when I come back, entire sunset was just dust peel on the floor because sun was hitting the sunset, just all the glue and everything fall down. And thinking back, this lesson becomes such an important lesson in my life. Because, you know, talking about, you know, Yves Klein saying that his paintings are just ashes of his art, mm. and uh, thinking how the process is more important than the result. Yeah. And then, again, going back into the performance practice, process is everything. Yeah. You know, result doesn't matter anymore, but the process that you go through. So that was really kind of meaningful lesson I will never forget in my life. Well, if you, if you tell that lesson, you have to tell what did your first uh, professor in art school tell you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to art school. And my first day in art school, incredibly enthusiastic, you know, like full of, of the, this, the, the, the incredible much enthusiasm to, I'm, I'm, you know, to see this old professor. So I'm like two girls and all the guys in the, in the class. Class is our 12. And the old professor come and he look at us and say, it's very simple. If you don't have balls, you can't be an artist. <laughs> I took this literally. <laughs> I went home, I cried for a week. What the fuck am I going to do? I don't have balls. <laughs> and then I remember le lately, I was this, um, the TV program, they asked me about 100 years of Picasso, whatever, you know, and, and then I remember the story and I say, yes, you know, I, you know, the Picasso had the balls, but we women artists have balls too. <laughs> so, metaphorically speaking, do you think you had uh, the balls from the beginning. Were you? Yeah, I just strong? didn't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't know. Okay. On, on that, uh, on the metaphorical topic, there's another artist. Uh, sorry, audience question. Are we not running out of time? We still have 15 minutes. Really? Yeah. Bask in it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 15, 15 whole minutes. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so from Ellie in the audience. Are there any regrets or anything you would do differently following some extreme reactions from the public to your performance art? No. I don't have regrets. I don't have nostalgia. I don't have like, oh my God, you know, the past. The past is the past. I, everything was important and everything was lesson and everything had a meaning. And all is important is now and the future. Mm -hmm. No regret. I don't regret anything at all. Especially you learn from failures and from bad decisions. We have to really understand that. You know, you, you don't learn when you're always happy. Happiness is a state you don't want to change. But you do things you are afraid of, the things you've never done, going to new territories, do things in a different way, being adventurous, never repeat yourself. You know, my old professor told me such important new he said if you draw with your right hand and you draw faster and faster and you're so virtuous that you can make great drawing even with closed eyes, immediately change to left. Mm -hmm. Don't repeat yourself. And always manage to surprise yourself. Hmm. You, you know, there's a nice part toward the end of the book. You asked yourself, you said, what have I done with my life? And then you actually answered the question. It was not a rhetorical question. <laughs> you, you had three points. Do you remember what you told me? No. Okay, number one, <laughs> you brought performance into the mainstream. Oh. Number two, you legitimized the re-performance. And number three, you made your Abramovich method. So let's talk about these by point, you know, discreetly, short. So bringing performance into the mainstream. There were actually a lot of... Um, audience questions about this. Uh, was this intentional 
on your part? Did you want to bring it into the mainstream? Yeah, I always want to maintain the mainstream. I think performance is one of the most important category, and it's something that's alive, you know, living, living elements. And it's so important that you know museums are still built on on the kind of you know middle century rules that you come to the museum, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, you look in the work, and you go away. But it's so important in to museum to create like living energy, energetic, you know, the form of art, where actually audience we understood for now, audience is sick and tired that look at something. Audience want new audience, young audience want to be part of something, mm -hmm. and being working with performance, you're part of something. Mm -hmm. That made me, um, you know, you contextualize the Abramovich method, and probably a lot of you know what this is. It's Marina's method of uh, how you prepare for your own works, which you share with uh, the audience now. You but know, you but as, actually, let's talk about that, how I got this idea. Okay. You know, it's more important, and you know, the, um, there's lots of material about uh, right now, people can look. But how I got this idea, I was looking in ancient time, and I was re reading this, this old book of Renaissance, you know, how the Renaissance art is prepared to make great work of art. And there was a really interesting um, the description. They say three months before they start making, let's say, 16 chapel or anything like that, they will stop, they will stop drinking alcohol. Two months before, they will stop eating meat. One month before starting, they will not have any sexual intercourse. And the day, the, 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 the three weeks before starting having the work, they would, they would take the right hand in a plaster, and if it's the right-handed or the left, the left-handed, and they will absolutely um, you know, be emotionless for three weeks. And then, the moment they start, they would take the pen and they could make Wait, I need to make the circle. They will make a perfect circle in the air. And then they are ready. And then if you talk to Japanese, you know, the, the masters, they will go to the top, or Chinese, they will go to the top of the mountain and they will confront with that, they call chi energy. And they will sit there with a long time in solitude, with hardly any food, just drinking water, and really getting, you know, that kind of energy ideas coming straight to their brain. So there was always preparation of artists how to do something which is incredibly demanding. And then I, I, when I went to the retreats in all different cultures, I learned so much and I make kind of assembly of the stuff I learned, slow motion walking, uh, counting the rice, uh, eye gazing, that I, you know, some things I invent myself, some things I practice, into this something I call the Brahmins method. Mm -hmm. But this was really important. It's not now enough that artists perform to, to, to re-prepare himself to do long duration work is so important that the public prepare themselves how to actually see the long duration performance. Mm -hmm. Because you have to, you have, to see, have completely readjust yourself to different time. You can't just kind of look long duration two seconds and leave. You don't get anything. You have to spend time. You have to spend attention. You have to understand what is your breathing. If you breathe too fast, you miss the point. You have to breathe slowly. You have to understand that sometimes nothing is moving, just maybe light across the room, maybe, maybe artists blink, maybe there's a certain gesture, and if you're too fast and too impatient, you miss this. So you need the same preparation as artists. So this is all a complex story. When did you really start preparing like this for your works? Oh, quite early, because you know I understood when you're doing something very difficult, mm -hmm. you 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 have to. But to me, long duration was really the key, yeah. because you know, in, if you're if you're talking about dance body and performance body, the two types of body, dance body can be you know obese, can be can be skinny, can be you know with very low energy, can people smoke, can take drugs, they can't be physically fit. They still can do. The, the performance work if it's one hour, two hours, and three hours. But the moment they start doing something which is long duration, mm -hmm. you have to go into dance body mm -hmm. because you have to train like they do. You have to train physically, you have to train mentally, you have to you know, see what you're eating because otherwise you just can't do the long duration of physical work. It's impossible. So this is like kind of shift how things are changing from the one body to another body. This is interesting. So Nathan and Tyler, who are in the audience, they want to know what goes through your mind when you're in a performance. And uh, somebody else had asked if you're ever bored. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> That's the key old thing. If you're in mind somewhere else, you're not there. 
you know, it's like if you're looking in the audience, if you start thinking, and it's like a curtain. Audience have curtain, you have curtain. There are curtains between you each other, and nobody see anything. But you have to go into this gap of nothingness. And the only way to get into that state of nothingness is being present. But the present is everything. And it's so easy to say, so difficult to achieve. Now, SB wants to know what your daily routine is like. Ah, uh, you know routine? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, which is so important to share with you. I am full of contradictions. I really love my contradictions because when I was young, I just want to show this heavy spirit, the, the heroic myself, you know, absolutely no sentimentality. I am, you know, breaking everybody's balls. I can do this, I can do that. But it's not just me like that. I have, a, I, I actually develop the, the knowledge of three marinas who are very nicely living in myself, very harmoniously. But it took me 55 years to get to that. So, heroic one, like, you know, no bullshit, do whatever, you know, go, go break any, any limits, any walls. Spiritual one who is really important in, in this state of mind here and now, and, and, you know, that kind of stuff, living in elevation of the spirit, luminosity, and so on. And that is great bullshit one come, comes. And the bullshit one is the one who love bad movies, love chocolates, love to lie around doing nothing. This is the lazy one, you know. But then, you know, I, I, it's, it's so important to have all three of them and show to you public all three of them. You make, this makes human relationship because all of us are the same. All of us, we have bullshit ones and other ones, if you really think, you know, kind of honestly. So, this is three of them I have to deal with. I think this is a good... <laughs> <laughs> good combo. Good one, yeah. <laughs> Uh, before, we, before we head out, I really want to thank everyone at South Bank, uh, Ted and Karen, and Nicola Dutton for live captioning this event. Uh, everybody at Lawrence King Publishing who's here and helped us make this insane book together. And um, to Hingston Studio for the beautiful design. This is really, like, this could be a weapon. Like, keep it away from children. It's a heavy book. It's 500 pages. Uh, and every single page has a story on it. Uh, most of them very funny. Some of them veer a little tragic because that's... Uh, what about the joke? What we're going to do. Well, you want to tell a joke now? Yeah. <laughs> Can we say the joke and then we have to say something that we're going to sign the books, both Yeah, of us. yeah, I'll, I'll tell that part. Which and then, joke you want to tell? And I just want to say that I can't spell the names, so it's just going to be love with love and my name. I'll give everybody love. <laughs> no spelling, please. Okay. We'll be signing for exactly an hour. This is a, a condition. <laughs> so I really think it's a good time to tell the Putin joke. Okay. I have two of them. <laughs> oh God, let's see how first goes. Okay, Putin is giving talk to elementary school in Siberia. And after he finished conversation, uh, the, his talk, he asked the kids, is any, anybody asked the question? Little Sasha raised his poor two have f fingers and said, Mr. Putin, I have two questions. Question number one, why you're invading Ukraine? Question number two, why you're killing Ukraine people? In this moment, ring the bell for the little school break. Everybody go for the break. They come back, and uh, Putin asks, is anybody else questions? So, little Alyosha raised his hands and said, Mr. Putin, I have four questions. Question number one, why you are killing Ukraine people? Question number two, why you are, you are invading Ukraine in the first place? Question number three, why the the ring, school ring bell rang too early. And question number four, where is Sasha? <laughs> one more. Shall I have one more? Yes. Okay, Putin again. <laughs> I'm ambassador for Zelensky, you know, the, 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 for the children and the hospital rebuilding. It's really important function.
and so the Putin jokes. So the Putin, the generals of Putin say, you know, things are going not so great, so let's make big banquet. So they make big banquet and they, you know, have a dinner. So the dinner start with the mushroom soup. The moment they start eating mushroom soup, they start vomiting, they are pain in the stomach and they're falling on the ground, they're dying. So the waiters are so afraid that they will be charged of some wrongdoing. So they call all the journalists of Russia to make photographs of Putin, the, the, the generals dying. So, so they're taking photographs and the one journalist said, but what really happened? And the one uh, waiter explained, we think that maybe a little bit of poison of one mushroom kind of leak into the soup and that's the result, mushroom poison. But then other journalists look around and say, I understand mushroom poison, but why two generals have two bullets in the head? <laughs> and, the, and the guy said, but they didn't want to eat the soup. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do we have to say something? <laughs> Now we're going to sign the books. I think this is it for tonight. Thank you.